Welcome to Transport Vlog and the voice of Paul and on Sunday the 27th of October 2024 the Bay Station construction site opened its doors to the public. The new station at the Bays will be on the Sydney Metro West Line that is due to open in 2032. It will be very close to the heritage listed White Bay Power Station building that has recently been restored and transformed into a unique art, cultural and event space. The main attraction was this viewing platform that allowed us to see into the Bay Station box which is 32 metres below ground. And there is something very long and clever lying in wait down below. And that is TBM Ruby and it's about to start boring the eastbound tunnel towards Piermont and Hunter Street. Sydney Metro West has six TBMs in total and Ruby is the final TBM to commence its tunnelling journey. And if you're new to the world of tunnelling, TBM stands for Tunnel Boring Machine. TBMs Daphne and Beatrice have already bored the 11 km tunnels between the Bays and Sydney Olympic Park. Their journeys took around 18 months, with the breakthrough at Sydney Olympic Park occurring in early October 2024. TBM Jesse is boring the westbound tunnel towards Hunter Street and was launched in June 2024. By mid-October, it had excavated over 600 metres and installed over 2,000 concrete lining segments that formed the tunnel walls. Here is a photo of both TBMs in the base station box before boring started. TBMs are always launched a few weeks apart and this is deliberate to ensure the best use of equipment such as gantry cranes and better utilises the staff on site as well. TBM Ruby looked very impressive from the viewing platform but was tricky to film through the gaps in the fencing, hence the large number of still clips in this video. It was named after Ruby Payne Scott, who was Australia's first radio astronomer. It's 125 metres long and weighs 1100 tonnes. At the front is the cutter head and this is the part that breaks the rock and soil. It has a combination of disc cutters and cutting knives and these are made of high strength steel. Also on the cutter head are nozzles. These are used to inject water or other liquids into the rock or soil to help with the excavation process. The cutter head will normally do between 1 and 2 revolutions per minute and is pressed against the tunnel face by hydraulic jacks. The whole machine is powered by electricity. The blue and white cylindrical part is known as the shield and its purpose is to provide protection to the engineers and operators inside and support the newly created tunnel walls as the TBM advances. Within this shield are conveyor systems to transport the excavated rock and soil, known as spoil, along with pipes to transport water and other liquids to the nozzles at the cutter head. The shield also contains the equipment to install the precast concrete lining segments that will become the new tunnel walls. TBMs have two jobs or phases that alternate when building the tunnel. The first is the tunnelling phase, where the cutter head bores a small portion of the new tunnel. This is immediately followed by the second phase which is called ring building. This is where the TBM excavation temporarily stops and a hydraulic crane known as the erector lifts the precast concrete lining segments into place and attaches these to the new tunnel wall. Ruby and Jesse are slurry TBMs and they are designed to bore the tunnels under Sydney Harbour. When boring underwater, slurry is pumped into the tunnel face to balance soil and water pressure and this is where the nozzles come in handy. And if you're wondering what slurry is made of, then I'll reveal that later. On the sections under land, these TBMs can also work in earth pressure balancing mode, with the pipes and the nozzles being used to inject water or bentonite into the soil to make it easier to tunnel through. The excavated spoil is picked up by the screw conveyor and then transported through the shield to the back of the TBM via a system of conveyor belts. More on this later. To assist with the ring building phase, each precast concrete segment is individually numbered and they are not all the same. And that's because where the tunnel bends, slightly different dimensions are used to create the tunnel curvature. These precast concrete lining segments are currently being stored in one of the acoustic sheds. They will be dropped into the station box via a gantry crane and then transported through the tunnel to the back of the TBM, where a conveyor system known as the segment feeder will bring the precast segments to the shield. The erector will then put six of these concrete segments into place to form a tunnel ring. The hydraulic jacks now use the new tunnel ring as a support to push the TBM forward and that's when the tunnelling phase recommences. So the whole TBM journey is a combination of tunnel boring followed by ring building, then more tunnel boring and then more ring building until the TBM breaks into the next station or access shaft. All the Sydney Metro West TBMs are manufactured by Heron Connect and those animated clips come from their excellent video that explains how TBMs work in much more detail. So if you would like a better understanding of the tunnelling and ring building process then I highly encourage you to watch their video. It's now appearing on the top right and is linked to in the description below. And it will appear on the end screen of this video too. 
so the TBM requires a newly formed tunnel ring to push itself forward, but when it launches there is no tunnel ring to push against. To get around this, a temporary steel ring is put in place, and this is what the hydraulic jacks on TBM Ruby will push against to start the tunnel excavation. In the acoustic shed are the temporary rings that TBM Jessie used to start her journey a few weeks ago. So that was pretty heavy, so let's lighten things up a bit. On the shield are these handprints and other decorations. These were added at a recent staff open day, and if you were there doing some handiwork then let me know in the comments. And one of the precast concrete lining segments also got the painted hand treatment. So look out for this one in the tunnel between the bays and Hunter Street when services start in 2032. Everything behind the shield is known as the backup section, and most of this is exposed. There's plenty going on in here, including a control centre, refuge chamber, hydraulic power units, pumps, switch cabinets, ventilation systems, laser instrumentation, and storage containers. These long pipes are likely to be used to inject water, bentonite, foam or other substances to help with boring the tunnel, or stabilising the earth around it. Now looking closer, and you can see electrical cables and many other components. If you know what some of these are, then do share this in the comments. And below this, and not visible from here, are conveyor systems to transport the spoil out of the TBM. Spoil is removed from the cutter head via the machine belt, and is then transferred to the tunnel belt via the cross belt. The machine and cross belts are part of the TBM, whilst the tunnel belt extends beyond the back of the TBM and is used to transport the spoil back to the launch site, in this case the bays. So as the TBM progresses, the tunnel belt gets longer and longer, and can often be several kilometres in length. Also under this part of the TBM is the conveyor system to transport the precast concrete lining segments to the erector. These are delivered to the TBM from the launch site, where the conveyor system transports them to the erector. So now looking at this part of the backup section. I'm making a few educated guesses here, but I reckon the white containers house hydraulic power units. You can see glimpses of what lies underneath, and this may be part of the conveyor systems that I talked about earlier. The unit with the orange door is likely to be the control centre. Inside this are monitors that display all important data related to the tunnelling journey. As the tunnelling process is largely automated, the TBM operator will be monitoring what is happening on the screens, and then making adjustments when necessary. And if the operator doesn't know which button to press or knob to turn, then handy quick guides are provided. This TBM requires a crew of 15 people at any one time. Behind the control centre is the refuge chamber, and this would be used to protect TBM workers in an emergency. It provides protection from hazards such as a loss of oxygen, the release of smoke or toxic gases, and extremely hot or cold temperatures. It has a sufficient supply of oxygen to allow workers to remain here until they can be rescued. Hopefully it will never be used, but it's there just in case. This is the last part of the backup section, and you can see how those pipes that you saw earlier go along the whole of the machine. This giant reel probably contains thousands of kilometres of electrical wire. So that's the components of TBM Ruby and other Sydney Metro TBMs, and again, the Heron Connect YouTube channel is the place to go to really geek out on these awesome machines. This is one of the diaphragm walls for the base station box, and sticking out of this wall are the ends of rock anchors. These support the walls and keep them vertical. This is the most common way to support diaphragm walls, and is used where there is plenty of space outside of the box for the rock anchors to go. When space is limited, temporary steel girders are used instead. You may remember these when the Brangaroo station box was being built. And they're also being used to support the Parramatta station box diaphragm walls as well. To handle the launching of four TBMs, the base site is much larger than many of the other Sydney Metro West station construction sites. Because it's so big, it has its own train service, so let's jump on board. In all the excitement, I actually missed the last train, but a Abiram was on board and he kindly offered to share his footage. On the left is the shared path that leads to the Anzac Bridge, and this is where I normally hang out to watch the progress of this station. This circular metal tank now coming into view is the slurry treatment plant. As I mentioned earlier, the TBMs use slurry to help with boring the tunnels under the harbour, and that slurry is produced here. The slurry will go to the TBM via pipes in the newly created tunnel. And after excavation, the slurry, which is now mixed with spoil, is pumped back to this treatment plant where the slurry is separated from the excavated material. This white tank with the pointy bottom is the bentonite silo. Bentonite is an absorbent swelling clay material, which is mixed with water to create the slurry that is used for tunnelling under the harbour. 
so now you know what slurry is made of. Also in this area are several metal storage tanks. These are used to store fresh water, recycled water, fresh bentonite solution and waste bentonite solution. So now about to go into the small acoustic shed. This is one of several acoustic sheds within the bay's construction site. Spoiler alert! This is where the newly excavated spoil ends up before it is removed by trucks for use on other projects. It's great for creating embankments or to help with ground levelling. Activities involving noisy machinery will generally take place within an acoustic shed so as to minimise the noise impact on local residents and businesses. So now up close and personal to this freshly excavated spoil. And this is where I'm going to wrap up this video. Please give it a like, leave a comment, subscribe if you haven't done so already, check out my Patreon perks by going to patreon.com forward slash transport vlog and you'll definitely hear me and hopefully see me in the next video.